This is Mile High. We have to do it better in order to move people along. Up, down, inside out. If you get your mind right, it is not. It is a receiver of thought. Because love is my first technique. It's now time for the show. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Mile High Podcast. This is your host, Dr. Daniel Knowles. Thank you for um, tuning in, grabbing, listening, wherever you are tuning in to the Mile High Podcast, whether it be on iTunes or Stitcher or Facebook or YouTube or one of the many other channels this is on. It's amazing to see the number of downloads the podcast has uh, around the world, and we're grateful to bring another episode to you. Uh, if you enjoy these episodes, which uh, we get so much great feedback, please share feedback by putting a review on iTunes um, and sharing this episode with someone else. And of course, if you do not have your calendar already etched in stone for Mile High in August, August, Colorado is the place to be. So join us August 17th to 20th, and you can register at www.milehighchiro.org. Everybody is going to be there. And today, I'm very looking forward to doing this episode with someone else who is going to be joining us in August, which is my good friend, Dr. John Chung. He practices in Florida, in Wellington. I've been uh, by his office. Well, actually, I got to take a selfie picture outside it and actually get to go <laughs> in. <laughs> but he practiced in Wellington, Florida. He um, graduated from the University of Central Florida with a BS in microbiology and molecular biology, went on to get his DC degree from Life University. Um, he's clinic director at Keystone Chiropractic, um, which is Wellington's one of my favorite areas to go visit. Uh, he's received postgraduate training from the International Chiropractic Pediatric Association, as well as the upper cervical training from the NUCA Association, National Upper Cervical Chiropractic Association. And he's a committee, um, committee member of the Upper Cervical Research Foundation. He has done so many things and he's going to be bringing great information to the Mile High stage and to this episode. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. John Chung. Thank you so much, Danny. Thanks for the introduction. Look forward to uh, being at Mile High and hanging out with all those great Kairos and uh, look forward to uh, chatting with you today. Well, I'm looking forward to having you out there too. The last time I saw you present was at Palmer at the DELT program, right, their homecoming last year, we were both there, and the information you shared was so incredibly powerful um, and um, valuable for the attendees that I'm excited to bring that up to a higher altitude up in Colorado. <laughs> so, um, and, and let's start out, you've had a, you know, let's start out with letting people get to know you a little bit. Um, tell people how you found your way to chiropractic just to get to know you personally. Okay, well, I was actually at the University of Central Florida when I was in undergrad, and I had always been into healthcare, so I knew I was going to go into a healthcare field of some sort. But growing up, the, uh, the thing that we were going to do, especially if you're growing up in an Asian household, is you're going to become a doctor, right? So we, I had this uh, intent in mind that I was going to go to medical school, I was going to find some type of specialty in medicine, and then I'm going to be Dr. Chung. And when I was in undergrad, I had a great friend of mine, still one of my best friends in the world. His name is Matt Westheimer. And he was starting a chiropractic club at the University of Central Florida. And he wanted some help getting the club off the ground. So I attended some of the meetings just to help him out. But during the course of attending those meetings, uh, I was learning about the philosophy of chiropractic, about how the body is a self-healing, self-repairing organism, and that when we want the body to heal, then the best things to do is to remove interference as opposed to try to treat a problem which maybe the body put there for a specific reason. And something about that just really resonated with me hard because uh, the uh, philosophy that I had always growing up was just to avoid doctors, let my body heal from a fear if I needed to, and it just made sense with what I believed in philosophically. And I... I started thinking to myself, you know what, if I'm going to be a doctor, I can't be the doctor that's going to prescribe a drug for every illness. I want to be the doctor that's going to believe and trust in the body's self-healing capacity. And that's what drove me towards switching my career path from medicine towards chiropractic. And it's been uh, onward and upward uh, ever since then. 
Well, and that's, uh, you know, well, going into a life filled with purpose. So, um, and, and Florida, Wellington, was that where you're originally from or, or you ended up finding your way there? I ended up finding my way there. I actually grew up in the uh, Tamarack Coral Springs area. If you guys are familiar with that, it's closer to Fort Lauderdale. Right. Um, which right. was right. kind of serendipitous because my parents ended up moving up to Wellington, Lake Worth. And when I graduated from chiropractic school, um, a great chiropractor named Justin Brown was a Nuka chiropractor. He had an opening for an associate. So the position opened up right as I was graduating. So I got to go back and practice in my hometown because of just some great timing and the fact that, you know, I got, <clears throat> got into Nuka at that time and uh, Justin was looking for an associate at that time. So it worked out really nicely. Excellent. And how did you find your way to your focus on the upper cervical spine? Well, a lot of it had to do with... Um, my belief in chiropractic. So if we are really about, you know, releasing the body's innate potential. Um, then I feel felt like you have to go to an area of the body that has the biggest influence on the generator for those impulses, which is the brain. And going through school, learning about upper cervical, um, I didn't pay that much attention to it because I would gravitate towards Gonstead initially. But then somewhere during the course of my time in school, I just, uh, I just didn't feel like addressing the lower part of the spine anymore. I really was focused on studying the neck and being completely enthralled by studying the upper cervical spine. And that's when I decided to switch gears from going from a full spine technique towards uh, an upper cervical based technique. And I started attending a couple of lectures by some upper cervical doctors. I did my first internship um, with an upper cervical doctor in Atlanta. And just going through the practice and seeing the amazing changes you could get through the whole body just by affecting one part of the spine really just blew me away. And I felt like it really represented that chiropractic idea um, that I had in my head more than anything else that I'd encountered. Excellent. Excellent. And so now let's share a little bit about neurology. Chiropractors should be excited about the nervous system. We're nerve system practitioners, right? Um, what are the things, what is one of the things about the upper cervical neurology that you find interesting that, you know, maybe others don't know? So one of the cornerstones of my presentation that I do with concussions, um, it piggies back on a lot of the work that's being done by Dr. Scott Rosa, who's uh, made a huge mark in the upper cervical world, especially with, you know, that's doing awesome. some documentaries like the 30 for 30 series and helping Jim McMahon. And it's also based on the work of a chiropractor that recently passed away, Dr. Michael Flanagan, who was studying the way that the upper cervical spine affected the way it compressed the neurovascular tissue in the upper cervical spine. So when you think about the upper cervical spine, um, we, a lot of us are well-versed and well-trained on the movement of the atlas, the movement of the axis, how the skull moves on top of it. But we don't pay quite as much attention to some of the soft tissues that are around that area which includes things like your internal jugular vein, the vagus nerve, um, the internal carotid arteries, and the upper cervical subluxation from some of the work that Flanagan was studying could have an impact on a lot of these structures. And if uh, you follow the world of multiple sclerosis at all, there is a concept called chronic cerebral spinal insufficiency. And it's basically when there's a blockage in the venous system that's supposed to drain the brain. So your veins are like the plumbing system for your brain. So your brain is generating all of these waste products, all these metabolites, and it wants to get rid of it, right? We don't want all that garbage that's staying around in the brain. And what they're finding is that if these jugular veins are compressed, then you're pushing blood back up to the brain that's supposed to be draining. And it's like you know, having a toilet overflow, you're getting all this waste coming back into your house instead of going through the plumbing system. And these upper cervical spine can affect that jugular vein in many of the same ways. It can compress it, it can push this blood flow back up to the brain, and that creates an environment that can lead to chronic degeneration like we see with Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, some of these Alzheimer's looking diseases. And um, I think that's why we're starting to see some of these changes in these same types of patients, like with Aaron Elser's research on 
uh, MS and Parkinson's. Um, it's got Rosa's research on CTE. And I think that is really helping to give us an understanding of uh, how the upper cervical spine can be tied into these higher brain functions. You know, one of the most amazing things that's still, I, I've known this for years, decades, and I know you know it, it still amazes me when people uh, get this breakthrough understanding that, oh, you could do something here and it could affect how you feel down there, you know, in your lower spine. It seems so simple and yet so many people have such a trouble, such trouble grasping that. When you want to help a practice member, a patient get that, how do you help them get that? So that's one of the things that's always a constant challenge, right? Because uh, yeah, when you're an upper cervical guy and you have a guy that comes in that can barely walk because he has sciatica that's burning down his leg. And if you know about nuca, then you know that's a super low force technique and right. it basically feels like you're just tickling behind the person's ear. Right. So one of the things we have to do is we have to be upfront with these people and we have to tell our patients that listen, it's going to sound a little bit strange, but even though you're having this terrible back pain and this sciatica, the biggest and most important thing that we can do for you is to get the head on straight for the rest of your body because it's actually your brain and your brain stem that's controlling your posture. So if we go in and we start to treat the symptoms like the sciatic pain, you may be actually missing what's actually causing all these postural problems to begin with. So there's a reason that your hips are tilted. There's a reason that your shoulders are tilted. It's because a lot of it is stemming from the fact that your neck is tilting off to the side and your brain doesn't know where it is in gravity anymore. So we got to fix where you are in gravity first and then let your body actually fix the hips, fix the shoulders, and your body will ultimately take care of that sciatica in many of these cases too. So when people know that ahead of time, yeah, they're still going to be skeptical, but it's going to give you the time to deliver the results if you're good at what you do. I, simple, clean, easy explanation. And, you know, I, I parallel that in my practice with doing network spinal analysis because the force applications are so light, so much is focused on the cervical spine. You have someone coming in with those kinds of situations. They're like, well, how come you're not doing this? And helping people bridge that gap is so so important and you just stated that really eloquently well so thank you for doing that that will help <laughs> people listening now with that um how did you become focused on not, not, i mean you're focused on the upper cervical spine but how did you develop this interest in concussions so i've always been an athlete growing up i played high school baseball but i was always into sports and part of the reason i got into chiropractic is because i love sports and i wanted to be a little bit more part of the sporting world Obviously, that kind of shifted gears as you know I got into upper cervical, but the athlete in me just never left. So I started taking care of different athletes, and they were suffering from head injuries. And when you start taking care of people with head injuries, um, they're coming in with things like dizziness. They have a lot of time um, with difficulty concentrating. They're having these headache issues. And these are a lot of the same things that people are coming in to see chiropractors with, but they don't tie it together with their past head injury. And it really kind of shook me when I took care of this 18-year-old kid who had just graduated high school. He was a lineman in football, and he came in to me because he had hip pain. But when you look through his history, you know, the guy was anxious, he was depressed, he was having memory issues. So he's showing all these hallmark signs of you know post-concussion issues and as we started taking care of them the first things that got better were the anxiety the depression and the head issues and obviously as time passed on the hip issues went away so it's with that classic chiropractic story where you know the person comes in with back pain you start adjusting them but their asthma goes away and even though you didn't tell they didn't tell you about their asthma it's kind of the same breakthrough that i had with these concussion patients and it made me think about you know what are these patients really suffering with? Are they really suffering from a brain injury issue from the concussion or are they suffering from the manifestation of an upper cervical subluxation? And I started delving into a lot of the science behind concussions and a lot of the science behind concussions actually started to match up with a lot of the emerging theories about subluxation. And it's been kind of my purpose and my mission ever since then to tie the two concepts together and help bridge the gap between these two concepts because concussion may be just 
uh, part of the most acute and most serious uh, physiology that uh, stems from you know these traumatic hits, but they're causing subluxations, and the subluxations can be you know the more chronic and um, gradual and insidious version of some of these traumatic hits too. So some of their physiology may be linked together and therefore solving some of that may help a lot of these patients, um, especially as more people retire from football, there's going to be more people that need to uh, get their neck fixed. Yeah, and obviously another area is that if their upper cervical spine is subluxated, it may impact their ability to heal you know, the concussions and the other Definitely. areas, you know, clearly. So very important. And interestingly enough, uh, when I remember, and I only saw this once, okay, but when we were in Iowa and Davenport, you had those incredible posters. What was the key? You had a, there was a, what was the headline that you had on them that was such a catchphrase? Your concussion uh, poster? And the concussion poster, it's called the Atlas and the Brain. So okay. it just breaks down bit by bit, and it's uh, it shows that toilet analogy that we have in the upper part of the poster. And it just talks about how you know if the toilet's getting clogged, it's going to overfill. It's going to dump all these waste products into your back into your house. Same thing that happens with your brain. If your veins are clogged, then it's going to dump all these waste products back into your brain. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is because the clog is at the level of the atlas. Yeah, so that's we call it, it the atlas the and the brain. And the clog. It was such a great visual. Um, and I thought there was another headline, but atlas and atlas <laughs> and the brain. So it was it was outstanding. And I know I know people would just love them because it's just so visually appealing and such a great way to explain it to, to patients and make it very simple and easy for them to understand. And that's what happens. Chiropractors tend to make things so complicated rather than making it easy to understand. Definitely. And I fall into that trap a lot too, because it's easy if you're pretty science minded to overcomplicate things. But, um, you know, you know, as well as I know that by making your message simpler without diluting it, then it's going to have a bigger impact. Well, I'll tell you something. One of the things that I've seen you do numerous times, and I don't know how much you want to talk about this, so go with it where you want to, is how much you've done like really specifically looked at how, what kind of indicators that I can use to help a person you know monitor their progress and use some use some pretty exciting uh, unusual things that you don't usually see in the chiropractic profession yeah so I'm a, I'm a bit of an experimenter so I've started to add some new objective measurements for people so one of the things that we talk about in um, subluxation theory is the idea that you know you want a lot of good proprioception so that you know part of the way that the adjustment works is that we increase proprioception into the brain but we never have a test to test proprioception so what i did was i started looking at different websites and through some of the concussion literature i found this really cool device where you could strap a laser onto um, a patient's head and you could have them actually take their head through this maze by guiding the laser through the maze and you could start counting how many errors that they're making because if they're making errors that means that what they perceive um, is to be the movement that is correct to get through the maze is actually not because they'll start to miss the target. So we're actually measuring how good is their position sense by using this laser and we'll pre and post them. So we'll count how many errors. It's not uncommon for patients to make 17 to 20 errors while they're going through this maze. And after we stop, we, we go through the course of adjusting them and we get them down in the single digits, which shows that they've improved their ability to control their head and neck again. Um, another really cool tool that we've been using is a tool called a Kineticense. It uses some of the technology that TVs and video games use to you know, monitor how you move your hands, how you move your head and neck. And what it does, it'll actually do a really precise postural analysis for you. So you can do a postural analysis within two to three seconds and a couple of clicks of your mouse. And then it also does a really cool balance test where you could put a patient in front of the camera um, and have them close their eyes. So it does it like a modified Romberg's test and you can see which way they're swaying, how much they're swaying. And then you can adjust them and you can post them again and you can see does their sway improve. And if we're doing our job really well and correcting subluxations and the nervous system is working better, then a lot of these metrics are gonna get better. And it's a really powerful tool that just shows the patient objectively that you know their nervous system is getting better 
Right, and then it brings them to a different area of focus to measure their improvement than how they feel. Exactly. Which most chiropractors neglect doing in their practices, unfortunately. Yeah, and if you could give a patient an objective measurement to show that their body is getting better, then even if they're not feeling better yet, at least they're going to give you enough time to keep on adjusting them, to keep on working with them so that their body can continue to heal. But the objective measurement is a powerful tool to show that, yes, we're having an impact on your body, specifically in the nervous system, and now we need to give it the uh, essential element of time so that your body can repair these tissues and get things functioning again. Right, exactly. So, and, and that's so important. Um, one other thing that we were talking about uh, before we started recording here uh, and doing this episode is you mentioned something new that I don't know anything about, but I'm going to check it out when we finish, was you mentioned something about protecttheneck.com. What is that? So protecttheneck.com is a pet project of mine that I am working on explaining the science and neurology of the neck. And we go into detail with some of the testing that we're using, why we're measuring proprioception in the neck. Um, we're measuring the impact that concussions can have on the neck. Um, we're delving through some of the research that's out that talks about how the neck is a cornerstone for you know, problems like vertigo and headaches and all these other issues. So we've developed protecttheneck.com as a way so people can learn more about um, what upper cervical doctors can do for the neck and so that people can have a better understanding of how they can measure things and um, what things they can do to help protect their neck so that um, you, know, you have your football player that can do neck exercises to make their neck stronger so it can you know, prevent neck injuries and subluxations from happening. And um, we just want to give people an added resource that a chiropractor um, is writing so that we can uh, just help continue to grow the credibility of this great profession of ours. Excellent. And, you know, I'm really excited that you're coming out to uh, see us in August. I know that um, you are a big fan of the Foundation for Vertebral Subluxation Research and Matthew McCoy and the work that they do. And, you know, this year we are supporting and promoting the foundation through Mile High. Um, I know you've also published some papers uh, associated with some of the McCoy Press journals. So this is all going to be super exciting. Yeah, totally. I, I'm always a big believer in whatever project that Matt McCoy is working on. He's been a mentor to me throughout uh, my entire uh, period since I stepped foot in chiropractic school. And anything that he's working on is, uh, is going to have my support. There you go. There you go. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, and so you presenting that information is going to be great. And by the way, while we're on that, uh, you've put out some papers in McCoy Press. Can you name what they were? I don't remember. It was one or multiple. I can't remember. I uh, published about seven papers in McCoy Press journals. So Excellent. they've gone from autistic spectrum um, to Parkinson's disease to multiple sclerosis. Um, still working on my concussion paper. Um, done a scoliosis paper. Um, some post-surgical brain injury paper. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's, there's quite a bit out there with uh, my name on it in those journals. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. And, and why we're really happy that you're doing, you know, uh, you're the presentation on the topic matter that you are, since we're focusing on science and research during the course of mile high in the continuing education session. So it's going to be stellar. So, um, look forward to seeing you on higher ground. And, uh, I also love running into you when we're in Florida. And um, how can people find you if they want to find your office or refer people to you? What are the ways that people can connect with you? Or maybe they just have an upper cervical question about NUCA or something like that. Probably the best way is they could uh, <clears throat> go to my website. It's uh, chiropractorwellington.com, and I'll take them to uh, my main website for my practice. Um, I'm also pretty active on social media, so you can find me on Instagram or Twitter at, at Dr. Jonathan Chung. And that's probably a great way to get a hold of me. Otherwise, you just uh, find me lurking around um, a lot of the chiropractic Facebook groups, and the chances are you'll see my name in some of them um, if you're listening to this podcast. Great. And we will put you know the links of some of those things you mentioned. So if you're driving and listen to this, don't try to write and drive and cause subluxations potentially. Just um, you'll, you'll have the notes within the podcast. So I'll have those links and so people can find you. Um, and... Again, we look forward to seeing you in Colorado. Is there anything else that you want to share with our audience before we go? 
No, but make sure to get yourself out to Colorado if you want to check out my presentation and a lot of other great presentations that are going to be there. Um, Colorado is going to be a good time. Danny is a great host. And uh, I look forward to meeting all of you guys out there. You know, let's say this. The last time you were in Colorado, um, I don't know, you may have been in Colorado since then, but the last time I saw you in Colorado, you did a lot of sightseeing, right? And I did. And I always tell people, when you come out to Colorado, like, visit. Like, stay an extra day and go do things, right? Like, there's great restaurants and places to visit. What were highlights of things that you saw? Uh, so we went to the uh, mansion where The Shining was filmed. You gotta um, do we, that. <laughs> we went and uh, hit some golf balls against the backdrop of the Rocky Mountains. Um, we went hiking in Boulder. So we did a lot of really fun stuff. So especially if you're an outdoor junkie like I am, then there's, uh, there's not too many better places in the country you could go to than there. Yeah, I mean, so don't just like come and fly in for the program and fly out, like get an extra day or a few hours so you can do some of that stuff. Seriously, um, you'll be glad that you did. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. So thank you for joining us, everybody, on the Mile High Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode with Dr. John Chung, please share the episode in social media, um, share it with a friend, and subscribe to the Mile High Podcast episodes, whether it be on iTunes or Stitcher. And we look forward to seeing you rise up with us in the Mile High State, August 17th to 20th at www.milehighchiro.org. See you there. Um, and John, John, we'll see you then. And uh, maybe we'll even see you before then. All right. Have an excellent great. day, everybody. And uh, keep, ch keep changing spines and lives and minds with chiropractic. Like our page on Facebook, www.facebook.com forward slash Mile High Cairo.